Hello and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport who are knocking down barriers and challenging the status quo for women and girls everywhere. What can we learn from their journeys as we explore some of the key issues around equality in sport and beyond? I'd like to start with a big thank you to our partners Sport England who support the Game Changers through a National Lottery Award. My guest today is Lisa O'Keefe, a former Scottish international rugby player who was a director at Sport England for 14 years and is now Secretary General of the International Working Group on Women and Sport, the world's largest network dedicated to gender equality in sport and physical activity. Lisa is responsible for leading the Secretariat while it's hosted in the UK until 2026. A passionate advocate for women's sport and breaking down barriers to participation, Lisa led groundbreaking insight work at Sport England, which paved the way for much innovation, including the globally recognised This Girl Can campaign. Lisa, many people know you from your years of working in sport, but many may not know as much about you as an athlete. So I wonder if I can start there. And and how was sport first a part of your life as you were growing up? It, it was just ever present, Sue, to be honest. I was one of four children. Uh, I was the youngest. I was the only girl. And I have still vivid memories of being down the local park with my big brothers in goal as they played football. I was the only girl. I had I had three brothers as well too. So a similar start out in a sporty life there too. And and how did you first come to find rugby? I first became aware of the sport when I was at school. Uh, a school which had been an all boys school and had only just started to take girls into the the cohort. And one of the links that the the school had was with the Scottish Rugby Union. And so every year you could apply for school boy tickets to go and watch matches at Murrayfield, 25 pence. I remember queuing up to apply for these tickets. And I remember the grumbling from the boys in the queue who were grumbling about the fact that girls were here now and now there's more people wanting tickets you know it can't be fair these girls are wanting these tickets for the rugby that I mean they don't even understand the game do they and I remember that so clearly now for me in my childhood going to Murrayfield was one of the most defining moments of my life um, back in the 80s uh, and early 90s Scotland were quite good so you know I, I, I was able to watch some amazing Grand Slam victories and those days have stuck with me but so too has this view that somehow we weren't allowed to be there that was my first introduction to the sport and then roll forward I was in my final year at university up in Aberdeen and I'd come down to Edinburgh to watch um, my local men's club side play with my dad And we were standing up in the bar at half time and over in the far corner, there was a group of women literally on this sort of muddy corner right up at the back, throwing a ball around. And my dad and I just sort of stood there transfixed and we didn't didn't say anything. And then and then he turned to me and he went, you could do that. And at that point, I was I was um, into my athletics. I was a member of my athletic club. I was playing hockey. Um, I just went, no, I couldn't. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. And he went, of course you could. And it, in that moment, I, I sort of thought, well, maybe. My instant reaction was, girls, women don't play rugby, right? So this had just absolutely blown my mind. And he said, well, we should just go down and have a wee look. And so we went down and had a wee look. And, and by the end of it, he persuaded me to go along on the Tuesday. And, you know, it was his enthusiasm and love for the game and his encouragement that meant I did did go along and I mean wow that you know that was one of those sliding doors moments the rest was history and I I I came into rugby in possibly one of the most exciting times in Scotland um this was 1993 Sue right (laughs) so we're talking a few years ago now 1993 
And I played, I played a few sessions. I absolutely loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. But I had to go back to university up in Aberdeen to finish my final couple of terms. And in the intervening time, there was the biggest sort of hiatus possible in, in women's rugby because the World Cup had been due to be taking part that year in Holland. For various reasons, the, the Dutch pulled out of hosting the tournament and with 90 days to go, um, a group of women in Scotland led by Sue Brodie and Sandra Colomartino, both of whom played at Edinburgh Ackies, so the club I was a member of, they'd sat in the bar and they went, well, this just isn't right. We'll sort this. We'll host the World Cup. So not only had I come into this new sport, I'd come into this new sport with an amazing group of women who did organise the first World Cup. So, so here was this new sport for me. We had this amazing tournament, the world, you know, coming to, to watch women's rugby. And I remember being at um, Boromir watching Scotland play England. I mean, England were fantastic, right? They went on to win the World Cup. But, you know, there was about 5,000. And I hadn't seen that many in Boromir for a men's game. So I joined, I think, at just the right time with a group of women the, the coach, the men who were the coaches, just everybody super supportive. There was no question of why why are we doing this or this is odd. It, it was just like the most exciting time to come into rugby. And yeah, I mean, that was 1993. In 1994, I got my first cap for Scotland. Oh, wow. And I, I mean, talk about fast track, right? So I started in 1993. I went away for a few months. I came back. I joined Edinburgh Ackies and they were like, they were best team in Scotland and just full of just fantastic players. And they put me in straight in at number eight. So here's a, here's an unusual story for you. So back in 1994, Sue, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't do tactical substitutions. You could only be substituted onto a rugby field if literally, you know, they'd carried somebody off. You know, someone had fallen off them. It was literally that, you know, to get on. So you'd be a substitute. You'd never really expect to get on the pitch. Now, I hadn't even been selected for Scotland. I'd been selected for Scotland A. And it was the first Scotland A game against Wales A. And uh, we, were, we were playing in Wales and we played the game. We won. I mean, it was terrible conditions, really terrible conditions, um, really muddy, rained the whole way through. I was playing um, at number seven, open side flanker, which for rugby players or know it's the best position on the pitch. You just just run around and have fun, right? Like the responsibility of a number eight. Um, I had the best time ever. We won the game 5-0 and we were celebrating this in the changing room. And as a the door flies open and it's one of the team managers for the Scotland team saying, Lisa, Lisa, we need you in the car now. There's been a problem. <laughs> We need you on the bench. We need you on the bench for the Scotland game this afternoon. I lit. I didn't even have time to shower. I did not have time <laughs> to shower. They bundled me into the back of this car, still in my Scotland A kit, covered in mud, get me to the changing rooms. Literally, they put a shirt on me, a clean pair of shorts, and they're like, you're on the bench. And I'm thinking, oh, this is amazing. This is all amazing. But, you know, no expectation of getting onto the, the pitch. So sort of 10 minutes to go in the game, one of my teammates gets knocked out. As the here it is. I'd never expected it. So, um, yeah, Scotland were leading 5-0. Muddy conditions. <laughs> Wales had to put in a thrum on the Scotland 10-metre line. And I talk about stressful situation, you know, just and, and I had to go in at second row, not my position. And I just remember just thinking, just don't move, just hold the, the strum firm, just do your job, just do, you know. And um, yeah, we, we held out and we won five mil. So so that day I got my first cap for Scotland A and Scotland, beat Wales twice that day, both five mil. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Wow, you know, what an introduction to international rugby. That's amazing, isn't it? And you were Scotland rugby number 34, I believe. In, is That's your... right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I feel old when I look at the list now at Murrayfield of, of all the players. But it, it was like, you know, for me, it was it, it was amazing because back then, you know, obviously a lot younger, but I didn't have any of the injuries that then dogged me throughout my career. So, so at that point, I could just run around so freely. 
and ju- it was just so much fun. And I just found the sport I loved. You know, all the other sports were were great, of course, but nothing captivated me like rugby did. And where did you play your your club rugby? So you were living and and I guess what did you do after university? You're working, living in Scotland still. Yeah, so so after university, I came back to Edinburgh and thinking that I was, you know, going to have this career in finance. You know, I'd, I'd done all my business degree and, and you know, was intent on, on either staying in Edinburgh or perhaps moving down to London. And, uh, yeah, playing my rugby at Edinburgh Ackies. So, you know, it was quite a sort of stereotypical in some ways. You know, Edinburgh worked in the city played rugby um, and I remember some of the the news articles at the time sort of saying very kind of stereotypical however you know but she's a woman so I, I had broken the mold slightly there and yeah I, loving my time at Edinburgh Ackies but then the massive curveball arrived which was I ruptured my ACL playing in a, a sevens tournament in Mull. Now we talk a lot about ACL injuries now but I tell you nobody was really talking about them in 1995 like you know the moment I did it I knew I'd done something really bad because I heard it go and the pain was oh it was terrible but I didn't know what it was nobody knew what it was really nobody knew what it was and I was stuck on Mull a wee island on the west coast of Scotland with no prospect of getting home that day and just, you know, trying to trying to do my best with it whilst everyone else is having a great time. I mean, suffice to say, by the time I got back to the hospital, the Edinburgh Infirmary, you know, my knee was the size it was the size was ridiculous. And I and I just thought, I don't know, this this is terrible, whatever this is. And that was actually when I had a moment of massive good fortune because the doctor who was in A and E that day was also a, a player at Edinburgh Ackies. And he knew straight away what it was. And he said to me, "Um, Lisa, we will do our best to fast track this through as best we can. Yeah. So I had my first ACL reconstruction in in 1995. The problem for me, though, that was the good luck. The, The misfortune, the bad luck for me was that it was the early days of support from the National Lottery or from the governing body. So it was. We were still with the Scottish Women's Rugby Union. There was an allegiance at the SRU, but but no formal partnership. Um, the SWRU got funding from the National Lottery through Sport Scotland, but they were they were basically given a number of places. So we fund the places. You decide which players are on those places. If you had an injury and you were unable to take one of those playing spots your funding stopped, your support stopped. And actually the, fu- the funding was neither here nor there. It was it was the support was the key. And that meant I'd had this ACL rupture. It had been repaired by the surgeon, but then nobody was there to give me any advice or support as to how to recover from this. And I literally, I'm literally, I'm you know, going into libraries trying to find things. The internet and really was still not really the source of information it is now. I didn't have any physio help. Wow. And not surprisingly, as a result, I had my second ACL rupture. And that one was the one that really was the big game changer for me because that one was quite devastating. My priority was not to get back to rugby. My priority was to not was to be able to walk down the road without my knee giving away which was literally what was happening and it it was a quality of life moment for me because I was so unhappy I mean it's desperately unhappy anybody who who has had a long-term injury will understand just what a struggle it is and you know I was what was I was 23 24 I'd had at this point two major surgeries and I still wasn't sure what the outcome of those were going to be. I couldn't play any sport, nothing, and I wasn't really sure properly how to rehab. And 
I also at that point felt I'm not sure I'm enjoying, enjoying my job either. I'm so miserable. So I've got to change something. I've got to change something. And I, and I think it's when you're absolutely at that, at what felt like rock bottom for me, suddenly you think, well, maybe I can change a few things because it can't, it can't get any worse than this. And I spoke to my parents and I said, I want to give up my job. I want to give up my job. I want to full time um, try and rehab this knee. And I want to go back to university. I want to do something different. I just want to, I just want to change. I just want to change. And they were so super supportive. And I went back to university. So this was 1996. Um, and uh, yeah, went to Edinburgh University to do a master's in, in sport, leisure and physical education. Because I, I thought, I love sport. I'm not going to be able to play it again. Um, maybe I just I'm quite interested in it I'm just interested in it I'm always curious I'm, I'm curious about everything um, and yeah let, let's just do that and by by going to Edinburgh University to do that I was out at Murray House where all the PE students were and I suddenly had access to fantastic physios strength and conditioning coaches people who understood this condition and really wanted to help um, and so yeah that, that's what I did and um, had an amazing year there, actually, just putting myself back together um, in lots of different ways. And, um, and I saw an advert in the library for what was then the Women's Sports Foundation, now Women in Sport, and they were looking for a development officer. And I looked at that and I thought, hmm, that looks interesting. I wonder if I could persuade them they would want me. You know, um, I'd done some rugby coaching courses. So I was coaching Edinburgh Aquis. I'd started to do my SRU coaching courses. Um, naturally, the only woman on the course <laughs> back then. And so I'd started to do my coaching. I'd, I'd, I'd gone back to uni and I thought, well, maybe there's something I can do in the sports world. My master's had, had taught me so much about the structures of sport, the history of sport in, in the UK. Um, it was also quite an exciting time as well because the National Lottery had been expanded. So previously, when, when the lottery first started, um, they could only invest money in facilities. But this was a change point where the lottery was now able to be used for revenue projects. And so it, it kind of just opened the door to to lots of opportunities for organisations working in sport to be able to access lottery funding, of which Women's Sports Foundation, now Women in Sport, were one of those. They were able to receive an, an increased grant. Um, it meant they were able to double their workforce from one to two. <laughs> so Cathy Hughes was no longer on her own. Um, and I find myself working for Women in Sport from their small office in Hither Green, just outside Lewisham, one of those sliding doors moments that was such a great decision. It was a great time to join because with only two people, suddenly there's just loads of opportunity to attend meetings, meet people at senior levels within organisations, speak at conferences and start to raise my own profile in a way that you know, in your first year working in the sports industry, you shouldn't you shouldn't have been speaking on platforms with the chief exec of Sport England or National Coaching Foundation as it was. But that was exactly what I was doing. And the other reason it was a great move was I'd always imagined that I might move to London because I wanted to play rugby for Richmond. Richmond Rugby Club, the 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 forwards coach, Mark Francis, was also the forwards coach at um, Scotland. And anybody who knows Mark Francis, um, you know, he has a great ability to make you believe anything is possible. Um, he's He just is such a positive, positive individual. And so by moving to, to London, taking this new job, um, the first thing I did was turn up at Richmond, not to play, 
but just to actually see Mark and and just kind of talk about where I was and what was happening. And before I knew it, uh, not only was I now working for Women in Sport, I was now the third team coach at Richmond. Oh, wow. I mean, that was fantastic as well. And your coaching career went from strength to strength and you ended up joining the governing body team at the National Coaching Foundation, as it was, heading up to Leeds. And if I'm honest, it just wasn't the right move. I guess I was now... Having made that big step of leaving Edinburgh and going down to London and and recognising the need to do the things that were really good for me, I thought this was the right move, but it, it just wasn't. The people were lovely. The job was really interesting, but it, it just culturally, I didn't quite fit there. And the way the organisation was seeking to work with governing bodies just didn't sort of work with my philosophy. And... I mean, I can't believe I did it. I left within nine months. The reason why I left was um, a job had, had come up. So first of all, I was really miserable. I wanted to go back to London. I wanted to go back to Richmond. I wanted to go back to the sort of positive environment there. And a job had come up at the English Sports Council, as was uh, Sport England, in their uh, southern regional office based in Rev uh, Reading, down in Caversham. And it was for a newly created team, um, their active communities team. So this was an example of where the lottery revenue funding had created this whole new strand of work in Sport England. And it was it was about how sport could help tackle inequalities and, and help people in positions of disadvantage um, benefit and access sport. And I looked at that and I went, I would love to do that. I'd love to do that. And I went in with no expectation again that they'd give me the job. Um, and uh, yeah, I was very, very fortunate that day that not only did they offer me the job, but they also um, brought me into the active communities team with an absolutely brilliant line manager who was Jane Ashworth, oh, wow. who some people may know went on to to establish street games. Yeah. Jane Ashworth, wow. I can't think of many more individuals who are more innovative, just inquisitive, curious, really prepared to kind of rip up the rule book and but always for the right reason, you know, driven by what, what is it that the people we're trying to help, the people we're trying to work with, what do they need most? What are they telling us? You know, she taught me a lot about really understanding the challenges that people face, really getting under the skin of it, really listening and trying to understand. That's what she taught me more than anything else. Um, and that was one of the biggest lessons that I got really early in my career, which I've held with me ever since. So you're back at Richmond too, head coach of the second team, as well as working for Sport England. What happened next? And then the next curveball came along. And that was 2001. I was watching uh, Scotland, England. The game was, was um, played at Richmond. England were out of this world. Uh, they were fantastic. And Scotland, just not in it at all. You know, re England won very, very convincingly. And I remember being in the clubhouse afterwards, talking to the, the physio at Richmond, a woman called Miriam Williams, and, and saying to Miriam, oh, you know, I watched that and my heart was breaking. You just want to be out there, don't you? You just want to be out there trying to help. And and Miriam said, well, why aren't you? And I was like, oh, because two ACLs, I'm broken. You know, that, that ship has passed, sailed a long time ago. And Miriam, who was also the Scotland physio as well as the Richmond physio, she went, no, it's not. It's not. You know, your knee is fixed. You're not in the condition to play rugby, but that's in your gift. If you really feel as passionate about this as you are saying you want to right now, you can do something about this. You can get back on that pitch. And that was the start of my rehab to come back to try and play rugby. 
that again, just one of those moments where the right person said the right thing and and really kind of encouraged me in a really positive way. And in your first game back, I believe you broke two fingers. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, I mean, it was just, and it was such a ridiculous injury as well, the way it happened. And genuinely so, I, the, so, so it happened in the game. My mate went, oh, it's okay. You've, you've staved your finger. Let me just... I'll just tape it back together. There was no physio. It was one of those charity games. There was just no infrastructure around it. I'll just tape it back together. So I played the rest of the match. And then my mate said, well, we should just get you in the car and go and see Miriam, just just to check it out. Um, and by all accounts, when Miriam looked at it, you know, the knuckle was facing the wrong way. And she was like, oh. right, you're going straight to hospital. And genuinely, the next thing I remember is waking up the following day because they'd operated on it, on it that night. And I guess that might have been the moment that you'd go, well, that's it. That's, that's it. it. Yeah. I've had enough. <laughs> I've had enough. Who's the first person that's there when I wake up? It's Miriam. And she's like, oh, this is just a wee, this is a wee hiccup. You know, it's fixed now. It's fixed now. Did you enjoy playing? And of course, I'd absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. And so, you know, I I, I just kept on. I, I, could, I couldn't play rugby for a few weeks for my finger but I could do all the conditioning work and that that meant actually I was in really good condition to then go to the Scotland trial and in 2002 I found myself back in the Scotland team and so I guess this, this story here is and, I, and I, I often find myself saying this I was really fortunate there were some amazing people that created opportunities for me to take part in sport I was I was really fortunate. I was in the right place at the right time. But when I had that first ACL rupture, I understood very, very clearly where the inequalities are because suddenly I was on my own. And that injury back in 1994, you know, it was 2002 till I was back in the Scotland team. And I'd missed almost 50 international matches in that time. And so, yeah, you know, I, I came back and I played 2002 to 2006, played in two World Cups, um, had some amazing experiences. But, I, you know, I lost a lot of time playing the sport I absolutely adore. And that's really hard to take, you know. And I, and I, I, I focus on all the positive things because, to be honest, Sue, had I not had that injury, I do not imagine for one second I'd be working in the sports industry. Yeah. But but I also have experiences along the way, whether it be recovering from that injury, whether it be some of my experiences as a rugby coach and some of the inequalities there. I, but, you know, I, I have finished my rugby career with a real keen sense of of the difference and, and how that manifests itself and how how impactful that can be to 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 women and girls who, you know, like me, I imagine just want to play the sport they love, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that clearly led then into the work that you did at Sport England. You were director of sport there for a number of years, but how did that then lead into your creating the Insight Directorate? Yeah, yeah. So when I first came into that job as as director of sport, one of your big tasks is is figuring out what funding you give to each of the governing bodies. And of course, it's a hugely, hugely important role. It's also a very visible role. Um, and you're everybody's mate <laughs> whilst you're making the decisions on funding, of course. Um, you get a lot of invites to a lot of events. But when I came into the role, I was staggered actually at the lack of data that, that I was being presented with. And I say that because my background in finance, you know, any decisions we made were absolutely based on what the market intelligence was telling us about the performance of the company, we're telling us about the market, everything we knew about our customers or or competition. And there wasn't the same level of data and and written down analysis of performance in the way that I sort of expected, if I'm honest. I actually spent six years as director of sport at Sport England. So I did two funding cycles with governing bodies. Um, I mean, I hope people would say we ran a much tighter ship by the time I left that role because, you know, I, I did make sure that we absolutely tied performance to evaluation. Um, we had the active 
people survey back then. And, you know, that's the first time that, that governing bodies and others became accountable for for driving participation with an independent evaluation of, of what those participation numbers were. The contracts were really clear on what we were trying to deliver. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I felt like I'd, I'd I'd done probably the most I could in terms of helping Sport England move from being a grant giver to being an investor. I had a really keen sense of, you know, this is public money and wanting to make sure that we were absolutely investing in the right places for very clear outcomes and then holding people to account for that. 2008, I'd done two investment cycles and I thought that was it for me. I thought that was the point. I was absolutely going to be leaving Sport England. And I had a conversation with the then chief exec, Jenny Price. And I said to Jenny, you know, I mean, I love this job, but I don't, I don't think I can do another four years and I really don't want to do another funding cycle. And she said to me, I absolutely accept what you're saying. I'm really interested in, in your reflections on your time in this role and what you wished had been different. And I said to her, well, I just, I wish, I wish that we as an organisation could much better capture the knowledge which undoubtedly sits throughout the business. I mean, honestly, Sue, you know, you could walk the floor of Sport England and talk about expertise. And Jay went, you're absolutely right. So before you think you're going off anywhere, could you just look into that for me? Can you have a, have a wee look at it and, and come back with some thoughts? And so I did. And I was given the scope to just go off and and just investigate how others are doing it and you know I looked at what was happening in the private sector you know I looked at utility companies I looked at the national trust you know and everybody was so welcoming they just opened their doors and they said well this is how we do it and the upshot of all of that was I came back to Jenny and I said what we need at Sport England is an insight directorate bit of restructuring thinking different you know we need to put this at the heart of the business um this will be a game changer. And she was like, you're absolutely right. You should think about doing that. (laughs) (laughs) And the rest is history, because that was back in 2013. And I did nine years, nine years as Director of Insight at Sport England. And I I put some really basic principles at at the heart of that. Um, I mean, the first one was, I just felt really strongly that as an investor, we should put insight at at the heart of our decision making. um, And that that didn't mean insight as in the insight team. It meant knowledge that was was, uh, throughout the business. We needed to make that really easy for people to be able to access that knowledge in a really usable way to make better business decisions. And I also felt really strongly that this should be done in a way that was accessible to as many people as possible. So I remember having conversations with colleagues who said, well, this could be, you could make, you know, we could put this behind a paywall, Lisa, or, you know, this could income generate, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, no, 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 no. No, we have to do this in a way that everybody can access it. 100% everyone can access it because we're trying to change the way we all operate. And if we do it that way, we've also got a better chance of people then wanting to share back with us their knowledge and their insights. And we all win. And I bet your parents are happy because at last you got this job that was more than nine months, certainly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, that that became the next joke, didn't it? Because everyone was like, are you ever going to leave Sport England? (laughs) And I was like, well, why would I? Because you know, I've got the best job in the world. And I, that that exec director of Insight, I mean, really, wow. What, you know, that was my absolute dream job. Dream job, working with fantastic people, really fantastic team. So while you're in that role, obviously, January 2015, This Girl Can launched. And we've not really talked much about this remarkable campaign on the podcast, but I am interested to hear from you why you think it had such an an impact and that development of the original campaign. Yeah. I mean, this is yet another story of right place, right time. (laughs) Um, So we'd set up the Inside Director at Sport England and, and I was really clear that 
whatever we did first as an insight directorate, we had to go and we had to work on some topics where that people would be interested in, where we knew there was absolutely, you know, as I would call it, a, a customer within the business that would would take that insight and do something really interesting with it, um, and and make some change happen, so that I could demonstrate the value in in working in this way. And the very the sort of second piece of work that we were asked to do was um, J- Jenny Price uh, came to see me and she said, "Lisa, I've got a, a ministerial advisory group um, coming up, and they they'd like to talk about everything we understand about why women and girls are less active than boys and men." And I was like, "Right, okay, uh, sure, sure, we can do that." And um, Jenny walks away. I turn to the team, and we're all looking at each other, going, <laughs> "How do we do that?" Um, so, I mean, we literally started with source every document we have got that tells us something about women why women and girls are less active uh, and we i mean we pulled stacks and stacks and stacks of information together but actually what what we were able to do and and also with our colleagues at FCB Inferno, who we worked with on this girl can, was always distill that down to some very very clear insights and and that's why this girl can for me, was so successful because it, it was absolutely driven by the insight. We shared that openly and then that allowed other people to come in with their interpretation of that um, and share their version of it, which allowed us to keep on refining the thinking. You know, one thing I have learned, Sue, is, is when you're working on a campaign like that, it's really easy to kind of get yourself a bit excited about creatively what you might do. <laughs> and and like that's infectious. And and you can kind of get carried away with what everybody in the room thinks would be a brilliant idea. Um, but that's why I was there, right? Because I was the one that was often the fun sponge that went, I'm loving this too. But actually, we have to keep on looking back to what our audience is telling us. And because we were so clear on who we were trying to make this campaign talk to and whose behaviour we wanted to change and in what way, we were able to keep on staying focused to that. And and the other big advantage for me was I was then able to tell that story and share those insights and demonstrate we saw this. As a result, we took this action. And as a result... This is what action our target audience took, and as you know, if you're if you're an insight director and you're able to share that story and that level of detail, it becomes a lot easier then to encourage others as to why it's important to to properly evaluate, collect data, do your research, draw out your insights, and use that to drive better decisions. Obviously, it did have an incredible impact, and I think reported that 1.6 million women started exercising as a result. 2.8 million women were more active as a result of the campaign. So were you surprised by that success or having done the insight and known who you're talking to and and the way in which the campaign was then put together, did you anticipate it would be that successful? I didn't know because we'd never tried anything like that. You know, at, at Sport England, we were used to evaluations of swimming pools or community projects. You know, I mean, we just didn't know. But but we we worked really hard to put in place a really strong evaluation that would tell us not only how people were behaving, how women and girls were behaving, but how they were feeling as a result of the campaign, because we know that you know we're driven by emotions, and that's that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to really help women feel differently about being active, um, and and their ability to be active. And I guess it's, of course, you know the numbers blew us away, but actually seeing the change in attitudes is the thing which I'm I think I'm most proud of because, you know. We, once once you feel able to be active and you feel able to take part in different activities, we all know, you know, we do stuff and then we stop for a few weeks. You know, we come in, we come out, various points in our life. Um, but what's most important is that we feel able to do it. Absolutely. This girl can obviously set out to tackle that gender gap, that gender activity gap. So I just wonder where it was and where it is now. And then clearly you've moved on to your you know, role now with IWG, the, the work that then you're doing in terms of that insight, but on a more global scale too. Mm, yeah. Um, 
So I mean, th- this girl, Karen, as, as you've already said, Sue, did have a significant impact on, on the behaviour of, of women and girls, um, as did, you know, an awful lot of our partners were coming on board delivering really interesting programs in order to activate the campaign. So it's it's that combination of a campaign plus activity on the ground is absolutely critical. A campaign on its own own can't do it. And we had three or four years where we really were starting to see that gender gap close. Um, and we were getting used to every six months announcing active live active lives results where the gains were being driven by women and girls and it was fantastic and then the pandemic arrived and overnight of course everything shut down and and although we were still able to to exercise of course and 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 there were some opportunities to be active we were noticing in all of the the data that that women's rates of activity were hardest hit and the same was true amongst girls um, and the attitudes towards being active and feeling able to um, were much more impacted amongst women and girls and it was heartbreaking so it was heartbreaking and it and I just looked at all those hard fought gains disappearing and and what was really really worrying me looking at the data is that everything was telling me looking at attitudes that when activity opened up again women would not come back in the same number i could see it every indicator was telling me that women were not going to come back in the same number and that we were going to have a big big issue i was contacted by um lisa wainwright at the sport and recreation alliance and she'd been talking to dr anita white now dr anita white was director of sport at sport england when i first joined and was you know a real champion of of gender equality uh, Anita also was the founder of Women in Sport and she was the founder of IWG Women in Sport and she had suggested to Lisa that perhaps the UK might want to bid to to be hosts of of IWG and Lisa said to me I'm just trying to get a few people together to see if there's any mileage in this and as Lisa spoke to me about it and I and I you know was 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 feeling so upset about what was happening to to women and girls' activity levels, um, I thought, well, this actually could be a really good mechanism for bringing lots of organisations together to to give us real focus and and reason to focus on women and girls as we come out of the pandemic. I mean, we were in the first lockdown then, so I was hoping it, you know, we were coming out of that first lockdown and all would be fine. Um, but but that was that was the motivation, and you know. F- Great job from Lisa Wainwright because she brought so many people together and was the real catalyst for making that happen. And, you know, big thank you to to Sport England and UK Sport, who were real the real drivers as well in terms of, of pulling the bid together um, and successfully pulling it together. And I said to you earlier, you know, why why would I ever want to leave Sport England and my dream job? Well, it's hard to not get excited by the potential of of IWG Women in Sport. You know, the world's biggest network devoted to gender equality, an opportunity to work globally to draw together all of the knowledge that we have, the insights that we have, and and to do exactly as I did at Sport England, make that as accessible as possible to to decision makers anywhere around the globe. You know, because an awful lot of the small changes that we can make to to the sports system to make it work better for women and girls those those lessons have been learned they don't need to be learned over and over and over again um and so that's that's one of my big jobs at, at uh, IWG women in sport is is to help people access that knowledge and to really put life into this global network so that that people who are making breakthroughs are able to share that and help others advance gender equality Obviously, you're now no longer playing rugby, but you are still incredibly active, especially outdoors in terms of cycling and hiking. So I'm I'm interested to know what brings you so much joy. And I also wanted to ask you, I only learned about bagging Munros when I spoke to you about it. So, you know, what's a Munro and how do you bag it? 
<laughs> um, well, first of all, Munro is um, a, a mountain in Scotland which is over 3,000 feet or 912 metres. Um, there's 282 of them, Sue, and they're quite addictive. Uh, how did I get into outdoors? So there's a couple, couple of points, I think. The first one is... Um, I learned at 23 that you can have a very serious injury or something, you know, it can be an, a moment in your life where overnight everything changes. And I went from being on top of the world, thinking I could do anything, to being on crutches, not sure what I could do anymore. Um, and it's that is something I will never forget. So I guess forever now, for as long as I can, I will just want to keep on playing. That, that That's how I describe it. I take deep joy out of being outside somewhere, either on my own or with, with a group of friends, just playing, just being active, just being outdoors, just moving. Because um, that was taken away from me. And now that I've got it back, I am doing everything to hold on to it, right? So that's, that's the first point. The outdoors is quite interesting because when I retired from rugby, um, you know, I'd done 13, 13 years between my first and final cap um, for Scotland. I retired after the 2006 World Cup. Um, and I guess I... I sort of felt a bit broken <laughs> because I was, I was just broken, you know, end of a World Cup cycle. And it it probably took me about 12 months after that to do anything, to get active again. And quite by accident, I'd gone up to Fort William. On that day, the sky was blue, the sun was shining, there was not a cloud in the sky. And I looked up at Ben Nevis and I was like, that's amazing, that looks amazing. And I thought, if it's like this tomorrow, I'm going up there, right? And of course, I opened the window the following day. It's blue sky, sunshine. So I ran, I ran down the road to Ellis Brigham, bought a pair of boots, bought a rucksack, some bits of kit. I'd done my Duke of Edinburgh, so I knew how to read a map, you know, all that good stuff. And I, I, I went up Ben Nevis, and I just, ah, oh, it, it was one of those moments. I thought, this is amazing. It, again, it just, it just filled my heart with joy um, and I came down from there and I was going back to Edinburgh the following day and I thought oh I wonder if I could do another one on the way home <laughs> so I did Ben Lomond <laughs> I did Ben Lomond on the way home <laughs> and that was the start yeah 13 years another 13 years so 13 years playing for Scotland 13 years uh, in pursuit of the Monroes I, I finished my final Monroe and actually I climbed my final Monroe with my two of my former Scotland teammates who who took the trouble of carrying a chair up to the top so I could sit on my final Monroe and just look at the expanse of Scotland in front of me which is exactly what I did Thank you so much, Elisa, for joining me as a guest. She's always been a fantastic supporter of the work we do with the Game Changers and the Women's Sport Collective. So it was lovely to have the chance to talk to her about her own career in sport. If you enjoyed the podcast, there are over 170 episodes featuring conversations with women's sport trailblazers that are free to listen to on podcast platforms, or you can find them on our website at fearlesswomen.co.uk. Other incredible Scottish guests I've spoken to on the podcast include Judy Murray, Rose Riley, Catherine Granger, Shelley Kerr, Ailish McCorgan and Eve Muirhead. The whole of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport, is also free to listen to on the podcast. Every episode of Series 13 is me reading a chapter of the book. The website is also the place where you can find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, our free, inclusive community for all women working in sport. We now have over 6,500 members from 89 countries who meet online and in person at events and benefit from a very engaged LinkedIn group, regular newsletters, regional hubs, and opportunities to attend industry events. Thanks again to Sport England for backing the game changes through a national lottery award and to Sam Walker at What Goes On Media, who does such a great job as our executive producer. Thank you also to my brilliant colleague at Fearless Women, Kate Hannan. 
do subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review, that would be fantastic as it really does help us to reach new audiences. Come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter at Sue Anstis. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport. <laughs>